Hi, everybody. There she is. Yay. Okay. <laughs> hi. This is uh, Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education at the Davis Finney Foundation. Heather, you made it. You made it. And Aaron, you guys made it. Um, yeah. we, we always have this little um, panic, like right before the top of the hour, like, oh my God, are you ready to go? Somebody's not here. We're ready. Yeah, so now we're all ready. Welcome to the YOPD Council. I am here with Kevin and Amy and Heather and Aaron and Kat and Tom. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, Steve and Gaynor are not able to make it with us today, but they will be here next time. So today we are talking about disability and insurance and Aaron and Kat are going to be leading the session and there is just so much fascinating information to talk about. I know we have a lot and you probably have a lot of questions. So uh, the best way to ask a question is to um, click the little icon at the bottom of your screen that says chat and a little box is going to pop up on the right hand side. If you have a question that you want to ask and for everybody to see then you can click all panelists and attendees and then everybody on the webinar will be able to see that question. If you would rather not everybody see it, just click all panelists and type your question and then we will take it. I will be sure to be monitoring the chat throughout the session and I will make sure that your questions um, get answered to the extent that they can based on the time that we have. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. I am gonna hand it over to Aaron and Kat so uh, we can get going. Sure, thank you, Mel. Uh, happy to be here today. And uh, as you said, we've got a lot of material to go through. Um, with that being said, I did just want to take 30 seconds for intros of the panelists uh, for any new members that may be joining the webinar today. Um, so I'll start and then kick it over to Kat and we'll just go round robin real quick. Um, my name is Erin Michael. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's at 42, and I do still work full time. Kat? All right, and I'm Kat Hill, and I'm in Portland, Oregon. I was diagnosed five years ago at the age of 48, and I uh, left work right away and have pursued disability income. Who wants to go next? Kevin. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Quark. Uh, I've been living with Parkinson's now for almost 13 years. Uh, I, up until very recently, was employed and working. Um, but I'm very keen now because I'm in the process of applying for disability as we as we speak. All right, Heather. She's on mute. Oh. Heather, you mute. Oh. Heather Kennedy. Heather. Not no, I'm just kidding. I'm a luddite. Um, <laughs> really, I don't know how to work Zoom. Um, I uh, was diagnosed approximately nine years ago and almost 10 now, and I have never applied for disability, so I'm going to be listening in along with the rest of you and asking a lot of questions, and I'm very excited to say that I'm still in San Francisco for now, and I only work occasionally as a contract worker, so it's tricky. Thank you. All right. Tom? Hi, y'all. My, my name is Tom Polizzi. I'm in Denver, Colorado. I was diagnosed at the age of 48 about 12 years ago with Parkinson's disease. And I worked for eight more years and then uh, decided to leave and, and pursued uh, disability through the insurance our company provided and social security disability as well. So I've been doing that for about two years. I think I've been on that, that plan. Great. Amy? Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Montemorano. I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Just like Kat, I was diagnosed five years ago at age 48. And um, I have been continuing to work full time. I work uh, um, as a teacher and uh, I have not been on disability, but I am a lawyer and I have a little bit of the knowledge of the legal side of disability and I can speak to some of that. Great. Great. Thank you, everybody. So we're just going to go ahead and dive in. Uh, so the way that we divided the agenda up between Kat and myself, um, so I'm going to take the insurance bit and Kat's going to take the disability bit of our uh, session today uh, since she's gone through applying for disability. And we just wanted to level set a little bit and let everybody know who's joined us today that we're just speaking to these items based on our individual experience 
and our individual experience that we've had with uh, people that we've consulted with to get some answers and some help throughout our own personal journey. So by no means are we uh, the end all be all experts in either of these items, but uh, definitely happy to share our individual experiences. Um, so for me specifically, uh, working full time, um, I do have a financial planner and oddly enough, uh, when I went to go meet him for my year end um, meeting to talk about, you know, what's going to come up for 2020 before the, the whole world blew up more or less. Um, you know, he brought some things to light that I was unaware of that I felt nobody gave me guidance to. And I was very thankful that he had opened my eyes a little bit uh, around a few particular uh, topics. Um, one of which is around how health insurance is viewed and looked at uh, from a legal perspective. And again, this is gonna be how it is specific in Ohio. Each state has some laws that would be different to where you're located. Um, so when I went to go meet him, I was also looking to leave my last job and start a new job. So he, he was aware that I had that going on as well uh, and recommended that I speak to a healthcare specific legal advisor, if you will. Um, so what I found out is in the state of Ohio, um, they've got uh, a definition of pre-existing conditions um, and there's really two ways that the state of Ohio looks at that. Um, there's a defined pre-existing condition, um, and that's a medical illness or injury or other condition that existed prior to the date the patient signed up with the health insurance provider. Um, and the other one is an objective standard definition, uh, which is a pre-existing condition where I feel I kind of fell into. Um, it's where... Uh, you have a, a more longer term um, disability, if you will, like Parkinson's, cancer, things of that nature. Um, and then the, actually there's three, there's a third one, excuse me, that's a little more broad and broader as well called a prudent person definition. And that's a pre-existing uh, condition where somebody like myself who has sought uh, treatment for a pre-existing condition. So if you were somebody in my shoes in Ohio and thought you had Parkinson's and were meeting with somebody but have not yet been physically diagnosed on your medical chart record, even though that was leaning to where you were, uh, you would still be okay under that perspective. Um, so when I was leaving my old job and starting a new job, it came up that in the state of Ohio, there was a nine, there at that time was a 90 day clause um, it has since that time shrunk to 63 days, where if my health insurance would have lapsed, um, so for example, if I left my old job, started a new job, and insurance wouldn't be available to me until 90 days, on that 91st day, my new insurance provider could have flagged my Parkinson's as a pre-existing condition and not covered it, not covered any of the treatments, any of the um, uh, sessions with my neurologist, any of my medications or anything like that. And I'm like, wait, what? How can that even be possible? That seems absurd. I can't, it's not my fault that I've been diagnosed with this. Uh, and I do think that a lot of people are probably unaware that state by state, you've got a window on how health insurance will interact with you based on um, any illness or disability that you've been diagnosed with on what they can pick up and what they will pick up. Um, and what that window is. So between jobs, even though I, was, uh, I wasn't sure if I was gonna be eligible for insurance right away, um, I went out and got bridge insurance through the marketplace, which is available under Obamacare. And I took that out uh, for me personally on a month to month uh, payment plan. And then once I landed at my new job and knew I could get insurance and everything was okay and I felt comfortable enough and ensured that I was going to be covered, I went ahead and dropped my marketplace insurance. Um, so that was the first big aha moment that I've had uh, with regards to health insurance. So I'm going to pause there for a minute to see if there's any coverage, because for me, that was a little bit of a bombshell, uh, especially for um, the young onset world who, you know, we do probably still change jobs here and there and some of those things that you don't think about on the day to day. Mm -hmm. So, Aaron, did the switch from 90 days to 60 days have any impact or 62 days or whatever it was? Not for me, because when I was doing the um, research and talked to my contact and uh, health insurance um, legal, uh, he told me of the change uh, when I was doing research for this event. So it used to be 90, it's now 63, but I've got insurance at my current employer 
So it doesn't affect me. Now, if I would change jobs again, I would have to be cognizant that I have, I can only go 63 days without insurance, without getting hit with a, a potential um, pre-existing condition where any insurance company, Medicaid, Medicare, any of them can say, we're not going to cover this disability for you because it's pre-existing, which is scary at 42. Yeah. <laughs> was, the, was the bridge insurance that you got exorbitant or was it reasonable? No, it was actually cheaper than what I was paying at the time for my existing empl employer. Um, but I had a really crappy insurance uh, platform um, or policy at my old employer, which is one of the reasons that I decided to leave that place. So once I was diagnosed with Parkinson's and started going uh, with the medications and the doctor's appointments, my out-of-pocket was going through the roof. Um, so that was honestly probably the single sole reason I decided to leave that place. I'm like, I can't afford to work here. I mean, it, it's insane to me. I mean, my, my monthly, what I was paying monthly wasn't bad, but if you had anything inherently wrong with you, it was not a good insurance plan. So I left and now my insurance is fantastic. And it's, although my job is not ideal, it's one of the main reasons that I stay there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm not keeping tabs on questions or anything. So Mel, let me know if, if there's anything yeah. we should move on. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to let you guys um, move on unless it's something really specific because I think that a lot of the questions will be answered and then we have yeah. some time at the end. Okay. And I will say, I don't know, Mel, if there'd be a way. I think that there will be, but there's a lot of um, websites out there available that uh, Kat, myself, and other people have used for research that we could probably send out to maybe the distribution list after this. Absolutely. Um, for people to have easy access to like the Medicare, Medicaid laws in the state of Ohio, where you can get free um, consulting and stuff like that. So yeah, I will um, definitely include those. Okay. Just so people aren't, you know, taking notes. I know it's difficult, especially if you're trying to write. Right. <laughs> okay. So the second big aha moment that I had, which was uh, specific to me that came up um, during my financial planning is you know, you do have to start thinking about your future a little bit. Um, and a lot of these things, again, I didn't know when we started talking about, uh, you know, estate planning and what would work best for me based on, you know, my income, um, the assets that I had. And we had a pretty frank conversation around how best to manage my specific uh, situation. And there was a couple of things that came up and a couple of different options that we had walked through. Uh, with my, my counselor, if you will. Um, and we talked about opening up a trust. So the two trusts that we talked about for me specifically were an irrevocable trust, which is the first one that we discussed. And then the second one was a Medicaid trust. So what I was unaware of um, is if for whatever reason, and with Parkinson's, this is very uh, realistic for most of us. We don't necessarily know how the disease is going to progress, when it's going to progress, at what level or severity it may or may not be impacting you in the future. Um, so to start looking at how I needed my assets to be protected suddenly became uh, pretty dire for me to start making sure I had everything buttoned up uh, because each of the ways that you could structure your trust, whether it's an irrevocable trust or a Medicaid, Medicare trust, there's a look back rule uh, that I'll get into a little bit um, after I explain what each trust is. Um, so for an irrevocable trust, it's pretty much where you can transfer all of your assets into uh, an account where they would be protected. Uh, but then at that point, I would lose ownership of the trust. So the house that I live in is solely in my name, but I've got a partner that lives here with me, uh, but who is not on the mortgage per se. So I, think I was under the guidance of if you get sick and end up in a facility, they can come and take your house and all of your assets, your jewelry, your cars, kick your partner out of your house. They have nowhere to live. They've got no claims to anything. And you're like, oh my God, this makes no sense. What? Um, but the thing about an irrevocable trust is once you put the assets in an irrevocable trust, then you lose all possession of them. So if I would put my home in there, which I ended up doing, I can't claim it. I can't claim it as an asset uh, to my financial income, but it's protected. So uh, if I would end up somewhere or have some exorbitant medical bill, they can't start um, taking money against my house to pay my bills before Medicaid or Medicare will, would kick in. 
So in the state of Ohio, how it works is before Medicare or Medicaid can help you out, you have to pretty much be drained to zero on your assets that are open or free to take advantage of for the, the state um, before they'll come in and kick any money to you to help you out. Um, and that's anything that you have of value. And so just thinking about that stuff, you kind of have to make a laundry list of everything that you do own that you might not necessarily claim by yourself as naturally thinking there's a value associated with it, but that they could come in and just run it down pretty much, uh, which was also a little bit of an eye opener. And then the second one is the Medicare Medicaid uh, trust, which has the look back rule associated with it as well. And that's pretty much the same thing. So if you put stuff into a Medicare Medicaid trust, the only difference is if I put it into a Medicare Medicaid trust within the state of Ohio, I can make changes to that Medicare Medicaid trust along the way if I need to. So for example, if you're married and you get divorced, um, you could take somebody off of that trust, but then you would go back to the starting date, day one, if you will, uh, from that clock ticking of that look back rule. So in the state of Ohio, that look back rule is five years and there's a dollar value that's associated with that. Um, and I can give Mel the link to that, but in each state, there's a monetary penalty that's assigned to the years that the asset has been assigned to you. So for example, in Ohio, the monetary um, divisible number is 6,905. So what I would have to do is take the total of my assets, uh, which would, let's for a simple example, make it, I don't know, 100,000, take 100,000 divided by 6,905, and that's how many years I would have to wait in order for the state to come in and start draining my assets before Medicaid or Medicare could become available. So the longer you wait, the worse it's gonna be. So now I feel like I'm okay because I feel pretty good. I don't think anything's gonna happen in my, divi my divisible number, if you will. Um, but the closer you get to, you know, as you get older and everything else, and that divisible number becomes a little bit more scary. And I think it's a lot of stuff that people are not aware of how these things work and how intricate they are um, and how specific you have to be with protecting yourself, your family and everything else. Um, and the last one that I'll mention is just uh, 401ks and IRAs. So I had some assets in a work 401k and some separate Roth IRAs that were not protected under uh, medical conditions that I migrated over. So now I don't have to put them anywhere in a trust or anything, I can still own them. But because of the type of IRA and 401k plans I have, Medicaid and Medicare can't touch that. Um, so it's specific to me, it stays with me. I can still have some flexibility to touch that cash if I need to. Um, so just make sure that you know how your 401ks and IRAs are set up. And those are my two big aha moments that I've had in going through health insurance and asset protection. Erin, I have a question. Did the financial planner help you with all of those pieces? Yes, and thankfully, um, very much to my surprise, I was not charged for any of this stuff. So getting all of my ducks in a row, I don't know who was on my side that day, but the health insurance lawyer, the trust lawyer, everybody through my, there are people my financial planner knew, he's like, just help this girl out. Um, so I was very fortunate under that regard. And you know, this is kind of where I was like, in my head, I've always heard people complain about American healthcare. And this is where I'm like, now I see it. Now I see some of the struggles and challenges that we do have in our healthcare system where when people need it, it does not really bode very much. I don't want to say in your favor, I'm not trying to be anti-American, but just stuff that you don't learn this in school. You know, you don't learn it. Um, I never learned that I should have taken out disability insurance. You know, in my first job, there was no 101 class on how to live life to the best, you know, and hindsight, all of the things I wish I would have done to better position myself, uh, you know, for the longevity of what I'm hoping my life will be. It's, it's very unfortunate in some regards. And, and I think it's a really good point that you make, Erin, that state by state, so we've got people listening from all over, and we're all from different mm -hmm. states, that it would be really important to learn what's in, what the rules are in your state and learn them early so that you have time to sort of do some research and 
And, and when we were preparing for this, there's also a lot of programs out there like at community colleges, free or low cost kind of classes if you're not sure about where you are and you need some assistance. Sometimes two employers will offer uh, like retirement classes. So, you know, taking advantage of those kinds of things while you're doing your planning makes sense because it is really different and it's really complicated. Yep. And like we said, we'll give uh, Mal the um, links, but the biggest one for me to keep an eye on right now is the Medicaid estate recovery divisor, div divisible number. Sorry, I stutter over my words. Um, so that can change at any point in time. So today it's 6,905 in Ohio. Tomorrow it could be 10,000. Um, so it's just some things in the back of your head that you should be keeping an eye on. Um, and the earlier you can start to plan for some of these things, the better off you're going to be, especially for people with families where you you potentially aren't the only only person who are relying on you know support and income and things of that nature. Yeah. Somebody just asked a question about uh, that we're being pretty U.S. centric. We are. <laughs> I have I have a dual citizenship though in Canada, so I. I, uh, we apologize, but it is, it's, it's complicated down here and it's, you know, 51 states complicated. Um, yep. So bless you. I think um, hopefully the, the latter part of the pro program may be more, more pertinent, but. <laughs> yeah. And that's just my experience. And just, you know, like I said, I just, the more people I can share that story with the, the biggest one for me was I should have had disability insurance. Uh, day one, I wish somebody would have said, you know, like when you people offer you life insurance, disability insurance at 25, 30, you just are like, I'm going to keep my money for today. Well, you, you don't know. You really don't know. Um, and it would have given me some different options had I done that. So, yeah, that's really sound advice. Yeah. Heather, did you have a question? Well, I just wanted to add a few moments of levity into what you're saying. By the way, thank you for all that information. That's um, that's news yeah. to me. And I'm in California where it's got a whole and a whole other thing. But while you were talking, I kept thinking of MC Hammers, can't touch this. Like that was <laughs> in the background, can't touch this. Also, I wanted to add that I find it really ironic that our most valuable asset is our ability to make a living. Mm -hmm. Not our homes or our cars or all the things that people are in fact, I think it's Ethan who asked a great question. Would it be beneficial to put your assets into your spouse's or partner's or children's names, which a lot of people might be scrambling to do in America because the election's coming up. Yeah. And one of the uh, two people running for office has agreed to put a cap on what you can you know, transfer over to your next of kin. And I think there's a lot of scrambling going on. So anyway, yes, it is a little US centric to add to what Wes said. And um, <laughs> the... Uh, also, I wanted to talk later about the social media thing and about how much we are being observed by people we are hoping to get disability insurance. Correct. About. So let's go back to that later, but I wanted to add those things, thanks. Yep, and I will just say for the state of Ohio, it wouldn't matter if it's in my spouse's name or not. If they're my spouse, it's, it's the same as mine. So whether it's in his name, my name, her name, it doesn't matter. Uh, once I become ill enough where people need to start burning down my assets. It doesn't matter whose name it is, unless it's protected, they're gonna get it. Um, and that's very unfortunate and sad, so. Amy, you wanna jump in? Yeah, really quickly. Um, so much of this stuff varies from state to state, Absolutely. as we were saying. And Ohio so is one of the worst, I will say that. So I'm looking to move, but. So, and so many of these questions are very technical. None of us on this panel is an expert on any of these questions right. and probably can't advise uh, some of these questions. But here's what I did, um, because I wanted to know about social security disability. I went to my support, the PD support group here in Philadelphia, which is fairly large. And I gathered some lawyers together to give a presentation to the support group, just the social security disability lawyers. And um, it was so helpful and so informative. And um, I would recommend that if anybody wants more information of the kind that we're not gonna be able to, to give you, that's a really good way to get free information and free advice to not just you, but your whole community. And, um, Absolutely. and if you need help, like trying to figure out what lawyers can I ask, you can go to your local bar association, they have committees and you, you, you take a look at who are the lawyers who are the leaders on the committees who, who work in disability law or in, or in health law. And you just call them and you ask them and they, 
for the most part, lawyers will do that because, you know, not only do they want to help, but I mean, it also is a good way for them to, to market their services. And so um, Absolutely. we had, we had an enormous audience for that particular panel and I learned so much and I, that's what I would recommend doing if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And the last thing I'd say before I turn it over to Catspit is uh, I'm not saying this stuff to scare anybody. Uh, you are taking the first step um, on how to educate yourself by attending this webinar. Um, we are here to help it's to the best of our ability, uh, answer any questions. Um, so don't, don't uh, take this as, you know, a, a doom and gloom. It's just supposed to be more educational and, and know that you've got some support systems out there through everybody on this panel um, and at the Davis Mini organization as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Kat, I'm going to turn it over to you for disability then. Okay. So I'm going to just sort of share with you my story and my decision-making process. Um, uh, because I think, you know, we're talking dollars and cents, but there's this whole other part about like the human part of it and the, the um, identity part and the um, who am I if I'm not working and earning income and how are we going to make it and, you know, that part. So um, for me, I, I was in, I had a great job. I loved my job. I delivered babies for a living and I worked long hours and helped a lot of families and I absolutely loved it and it was absolutely exhausting for me. So um, I hadn't felt good for a long time and, and once I took stepped back from work for a little while while I was trying to figure out what was going on, I noticed that I, when I slept and I ate regularly, I felt a whole lot better. So for me, it became about how I was gonna weigh out the rest of my life. I have a lot of years left and with any luck. <laughs> and I had to really think about, did I want to perhaps burn through what I had left out in the, at the hospital all hours of the, the you know, day and night and day and night and day and night. Um, or did I want to try to balance it and do more self-care? I thought I was, I'm both a nurse and a nurse practitioner and I could have stepped back and I could have taught um, leaving though my current position after a diagnosis, however, was difficult. It was a big step down in income and I left my long-term disability insurance. Um, it was not an option to go part-time. I was on faculty at two universities, but it was such a substantial pay cut that I had to think about, did I want the rest of my years of income to be based on a lower income, keep working, or did I want to pursue disability? And, and I was um, fortunate enough to work for an employer who offered um, consulting with a group that specialized in social security disability. And I was able to work with an attorney group to go through the process. It was a long process. It is not something that happens overnight. Um, it's, there's a lot of legal ease in, in what you apply for. Amy, I'm sure that, that I, I wish you would have come and talked to us in Portland. <laughs> um, and it was really intimidating. It was, it was a challenging thing for me because I, I didn't want to be focusing on disability. I wanted to be focusing on wellness and feeling better. Um, but it, I was declined twice in the social security disability process, um, even though my hands didn't weren't working real well and I needed to do things like suture and um, do a lot of uh, procedure type things. And um, uh, so I was surprised by that. And I think being younger, perhaps our applications are looked at differently. We have a longer amount of time to collect disability. Um, so I was, I was awarded disability after I had a hearing in front of a judge um, and the group that we consulted with provided an attorney and representation for me at that group. Um, so I now collect social security disability. It took me about two years um, in the, the process to apply for disability. During that two year time, my employer, I had long term disability through my employer that was about a quarter of my um, income previously. So 
part of that human part was saying, okay, I'm the primary breadwinner. <laughs> I'm now like a quarter of, of what I'm going to do. How am I going to navigate that? So we have looked really creatively about how we finance things. We had two kids in college and one in high school at the time. And I'll tell you, it, when push comes to shove, you get creative. And um, it's been worth it for me to transition out of a work situation, a stressful, around the clock, high pressure situation to working more as a volunteer. So, um, but I had to weigh the income factor. If I had been in my 60s, I think I probably would have done something at the university, worked for a little while and then gone on um, disability at 65. I chose to keep my insurance through my husband because it cost me more out of pocket to have Medicare, even though Medicare comes with being granted social security disability. Um, but you have to have a, a oh, what's it called? A supplemental insurance with that. So we kind of sat down and looked at all the pieces, asked a lot of questions and Frankly, I'm not as well set up as Aaron. We don't have our house in a trust yet. And, um, but I, I'm going to get there. I'm very inspired, Aaron. I'm, I'm putting it on the list, but Thank you. Um, it's, uh, I, I know we need to do it. And it's, um, and I don't have any regrets. It's, it's been a little hard on my ego. Um, I don't wear my white coat. Um, I don't have my big director name. Um, uh, you know, but I, but I, I believe that it's somebody else's turn to do that work now. And it's my turn to um, shift gears and try to get involved the way I'm getting involved and take care of myself. Cause I want to be around with the people that I love. Yeah. Kev. So what's your recommendations for a newbie like me, who's just now in the process of, of going through, you know, I, I mean, it's almost overwhelming, you know, this, you know, I'm in healthcare and for, even for me, who works and lives in healthcare, I, this is a lot of the jargon is just going way over the top of my head. I have a degree in healthcare management and I couldn't figure it out, Kevin. So my advice is talk to somebody who, who knows. I, I would absolutely consult with a group that specializes in in social security disability because they'll help walk you through and they'll ask you the questions they'll help you figure out what paperwork you need to get from physicians what kind of statements need to be made it got complicated for me because i was involved in a clinical trial <laughs> And some of that documentation wasn't available. So I had to do a lot of legwork. It, and um, they helped me do that. And while I agree with Amy, our, our, our resident attorney, thank you, Amy, for being here. I do appreciate attorneys. I, I um, a, 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 a financial advisor or a planner, but somebody who knows social security, needs to be involved in the picture because I just didn't get the, the answers anywhere else that worked. And I was in healthcare, you know, I was billing Medicare for my patients. That's sort of the stage that I'm at right now. You know, my first call was to the Davis Finney Foundation and they put me in touch with many people, including people on this council who, who were my second calls. Yeah. Um, and then really just, you know, the ambassadors and talking to people who actually gone through it yeah. made you feel a lot better. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the, the issue is short-term disability is relatively easy to manage because, yeah. you know, companies and employers deal with that all the time. Right. It's transition from short to long-term, which I think is a great unknown for many of us. Mm -hmm. People are asking too, so I have to do paperwork every year um, to say that I still have Parkinson's, that I'm not working, um, <laughs> and that I'm not better. But I like to think I'm better every year, but perhaps not better in terms of Parkinson's. But, but there, it, you become really good at paperwork. So paperwork becomes your job in the short run until everything's approved. Um, 
and it's a process. I'm grateful we have it. I'm grateful that I have a quarter of my income. I'm, I'm blessed that, that it's an option, but it's also a real lifestyle change and it's worth it. It's been worth it for me. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to live longer because I'm doing it this way. Yeah. So one of the, Oh, go ahead, Amy. Yeah. I wanted to defend lawyers for a second. Just yeah, really, really quickly. I know, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Because like I, I am of the motto that lawyers should not get involved in anything unless you absolutely have to get them involved. Um, and, but when it comes to healthcare and social security and disability, the risk is very high that someone who's not an expert will make a mistake. And the consequences of making a mistake can be very long lasting and very severe, right? As you know, because it takes a little while to get back in once you've been denied once. And the lawyers that I was talking about that I got together on a panel, they were, they only did social security disability. They were very specialized. So that's, that's the kind of, used. yeah. So that's the kind of person that I was talking about. And in fact, one of them worked for many years with the social security Dis administration. He was, he used to be like the decision maker. So he knew everything. Yeah. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, the very, very specialized kind of lawyers who would not know how to advise us on long-term disability, that, you know, they only do social security disability. So right. I, I would, if I'm going through this process, I, I would not, I would not go through it without some advice, but I would educate myself first. And there's a lot of information out there to educate yourself on, including reading just even the website of the social security administration. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And some other books, the NOLO line of books is really, really good for do-it-yourself, understanding the law. Say that again, no. N-O-L-O, -O, NOLO. NOLO, NOLO yes. line of books. See? It's a, it's a legal publisher that publishes legal information for regular people, and they have a, they have a lot of books on disability and insurance. It's really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but you can survive it. You can do it. If I survived it, you can survive it. Trust me. But get, don't do it by yourself. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, uh, barely often we get questions about um, people that get denied, they're not bad enough. They're, they, so has anybody gone through that process? And is there anything that you can share with um, people about, you know, what that is? And, you know, you know, I think Parkinson's a lot of times is, is difficult to say, like, I am bad enough mm -hmm. that I can't work. And to be able to talk about the cognitive decline or the, you know, the multitasking and the complex situations that you're dealing with uh, doesn't show up perfectly um, on a test, right? So um, can you talk, can anybody talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's an important thing uh, that you bring up, Mel, uh, to make sure when you're applying for disability or disability insurance that um, you have them review that within within yourself you need to review that with the uh, provider all the other kinds of symptoms that are involved with parkinson's disease so disability tends to look at physical performance mm -hmm. not many of them look at including social security not many not, not many of them look at the cognitive part but that's probably the biggest player in most of us who are on disability with parkinson's disease is really the the, uh, the non-motor symptom elements and for my decision, fatigue in, influenced the, um, the decision-making around my schedule. Um, there was a vocational rehab specialist at the hearing um, that the judge referred to several times asking, with this disease, does this happen? Because I would say, you know, I listed the challenges for me and some of it had to do with the you know the intensity the multitasking and some of the non-motor at the time i um i wasn't taking carbidopa yet and my I, my tremor was and i was nervous mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was very easy to have those physical symptoms um and i think we all want to paint a rosy picture sometimes with our providers and i think it's really important to have early honest conversations with our provider. Um, you know, are there bowel issues? Are there urinary issues? Are they, you know, what is really impacting your work? It's embarrassing to say, I'm not keeping up like I should. I have five patients in labor and five babies coming and I'm having trouble keeping up. And that that's real. And it's really hard to say because it's, it's ego driven, but yeah, it's, it's important that you have those conversations because they're documented 
and that documentation is shared with Social Security. So being key, transparent. Key points, very, very good points you made there. Well, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Kev. Yeah, I have a question for the panel because, you know, we're part of a group that believes in a lot of self-help, self-motivation, get out and exercise, and really lift yourself up, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can almost be construed as a double-edged sword, right? Because you're almost like faking your wellness, right? Yes. So do you have advice for that? Um, my... I don't know if I advise, I, I have, it's really, really hard to go in front of a judge and say, I'm having trouble doing my job. I have an incurable progressive disease. I don't feel well. <laughs> I can't do certain things. And I think um, it's a real, um, you have to dig deep because I think you can say I can be a positive person and I can still have this process happening. That's really hard. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I even tear up now. It's hard to say, you know, I don't want to define myself as disabled. It's, I'm abled in a different way, but, um, you know, it's One of the things that I learned from the panel of social security lawyers is exactly that, Kevin, is there's a huge tension between being um, self-sufficient and strong and what you have to prove to get social security disability. And it's in that tension that we are all very uncomfortable as, as Kat is. And there's no, um, there's no easy way through that. And as Heather mentioned, when you're out here advocating for for PD and being sort of a representative of someone who's living well with PD, well, that might be information that Social Security is going to look at and say, you're not disabled. It's a really difficult, uh, it's a really difficult um, bridge. And it, I think that the only way to change that is through advocacy and changing, changing some laws. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, and a lot of it depends on the regulatory environment. And um, what I learned very simply is that you, you must regularly and consistently tell your doctor all of the different ways that your life is negatively impacted and then take a deep breath go mm -hmm. off the record and just talk about how well you're doing otherwise right right because you, the doctor's records need to be consistently documenting yeah you know your limitations but it's really really hard it, it so is. it goes against our our mission and our grain i know well, exactly yeah, yeah. Kevin, you know, I, like, oh, I want disability but i i did ride my bike 40 miles today like oh is that wrong right right and, don't and tell your doctor say, or, or tell your doctor somewhere yeah yeah and you want to say hey you know this is basically my medicine like i just took a pill mm -hmm. by riding my bike mm -hmm. and that's not that's not understood right that's that's not how right. they, Decide. It's yeah. just what I, it's what I was like, told by this million. I'm sorry, Amy, what? I just said that that's what I was told. I'm not giving advice to sort of yeah. to be cagey yeah. with your doctor, but that's, that's <laughs> the advice that I, that I heard. Yeah. Heather's had her hand up. Yeah. Yeah, Heather. yeah. I was just going to use that example, Mel. I was going to say some days I can't walk, but I can cycle or I can run, but I can't walk. How do you explain that? And of all the indignities that we are forced to endure from this condition. None is worse than having to be simultaneously strong and inspirational and strong for everyone, your family and keeping a stiff upper lip and not complaining, and then also desperately needing support and desperately needing to be honest about your own capabilities changing constantly. It's like we're all walking on quicksand. We can't anticipate certain things and yet we wanna be employable and yet we want to be supported. It's like, which do we choose? It's very hard to, to do that. I was just going to add, add also that um, I think I would also ask, do employers or potential, uh, do the people looking at our disability have access to our neuropsychology tests? Just curious. And I, you know, I've never had a neuropsychology test that wasn't associated with a clinical trial. And those are protected then? <clears throat> They couldn't get the, the clinical trial notes until the trial had ended, the clinical trial. Okay. 
I don't they, think anyone's protected it. other than yeah the, the trial stuff. No, but I could they, be wrong. You can you they can, can. Sign off that, that people can have access to it. But I mean you you don't right. need you can go get um, a psych test and actually we recommend everybody do that <laughs> initially because it's a really great thing to um, be able to go to back to that benchmark uh, with your neuropsych and uh, you can always you know share that and that's a you know, that would be, if I were going up against a judge, I'd want to say, here's all the evidence. Here's everything I'm doing. No different than my movement disorder specialist, right? Yeah. Karen? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing um, in prepping for this with Kat. One of the things that I had learned from her that, again, I had no idea, and she kind of hit the nail on the head, we do have an incurable disease. But in her state, until you hit a certain age, you have to go through this process every year and have go in front of them and have them tell you every year you're approved or denied for disability, which is like, what? That makes no sense. I'm like, why? Be, why do we have to do this? I don't have to go in front of a judge every year. I just have to turn in paperwork yeah, and, that's crazy, um, and though. chart notes. I know. And I, and I, um, but I, I, I've accepted that process as part of my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I'm, I am grateful for the process as painful as it is. I also think that um, for all of us that like to paint a, a positive picture, I think that's a good, powerful thing. Ooh, muscles, yeah, we're strong. strong. We're strong, no, we are I strong. It, it, but it is also, we have a, 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 a baseline of, of being human and the humanness is important i think in saying i can be strong because i've worked through some of this part and i've faced this a bit you know my my father died from parkinson's related complications my uncle died from parkinson's related complications um i have another uncle struggling now um in the late stages i've i've seen my future a bit and um and I'm determined to keep a smile on my face and be honest about what this disease is. You know, that's our, that we are, we are as obliged to do that for our audience as we are to put on the sunshine. You know, really? I mean, anyway, that's my two cents. My goodness, I'm very preachy today. Forgive me, everybody. Oh, <laughs> Don't give me the mic. <laughs> well, someone, someone had mentioned, someone had mentioned that um, they were told that they weren't quite disabled enough. It's like, what do they want from us? Like, which way do they want it? You know, like, we can't win sometimes. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think your your providers are really your allies in this process. Your your healthcare providers. Uh, my my primary <clears throat> care has been really a huge advocate for me. My my movement disorder specialist is wonderful, but my primary care is somebody that has really gone to bat and helped me with some of the language. Primary care providers by nature are supposed to be the networkers and the sort of the clearinghouse for us. So using them, using that, there may be social workers in the office that may, may be able to help you. There are certainly resources at the Davis Finney Foundation, your local support groups, um, but don't do it alone and, and know that it's a process and know that it's humbling and know that you can survive it. You know, you can, but don't do yeah. it by yourself. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's an honesty, an honesty deal. You know, you got to be honest with yourself and with your provider providers, your, your, your health network providers, but also your attorney, your financial planner and your health, your health insurance provider. I mean, I think that that's who you assemble as your team including the health insurance provider, because they, they want to, they're in the game to help you. I mean, I understand that that it seems scary to front, front them, but they were very, very good for me to work with. The other thing is um, when you hear you have Parkinson's disease and you're young onset, it's not the end of the, end of the game. You can work for quite a, quite a few years afterwards. There will be a time that comes along where you realize that you cannot do what you were doing before because, you know, you may have a responsibility to to the corporation or to your employees or your employer that you're no longer able to meet. 
And that's kind of a balancing point that you're going to approach and, and you've got to decide, well, it's time to go now. Or if I choose to stay, you know, there's, there's, there, there could be consequences to both, but I think, um, you know, gathering your resources and understanding, reading, understanding, researching what you can about this process, the short term, the long term, social security, disability, Medicare, Medicaid, and it's a lot, a lot to learn. It's a, it's a PhD, but that's that yeah. you'll get there. You'll get there and you'll get there. Okay. Uh, Tom, I think part of it also is that you have to have honest conversations with your employer that are both ways. Because, you know, you've got to ask them, am I delivering or not? Or, and, and then if you say, I'm, they say, well, we expect more out of you, then maybe you start going on a tapered plan of some kind. But if you're not having that conversation, you could just, you know, be surprised all of a sudden. Well, yeah, exactly. Good, good point, Kevin. With my employer, it was, you know, I told him, my, my boss, who was my business partner in the news, and he said, uh, you know, you can stay here as long as you want. Very gracious comment back to me, which I appreciated. But I said, I can't, I can't make that determination. You're going to see what short, the shortfalls are in me. I look at the same ugly guy in the mirror every day. So, I mean, I, I, I can't tell how I am or am, am not. But you're going to have to help me with this because we owe this to our company. We owe this to our employees. I can't. There will, be come, there will come a time that I won't be able to, to uphold my end of the bargain. And, and that came along and we got through it surprisingly well. I think it was just um, like Kat pointed out, you got to dig deep and, and uh, you know, just face the music and you'll, you'll get through it. I promise. I also wanted to add, I, I have a friend who's paying child support for several children and that person is disabled and that person just lost their job and has to continue paying child support from what little they get now from their social security and or disability. So there are some situations that are really tough under the circumstances. Uh, depends on where you live, again. Wow. Absolutely. Um, I just wanna go through um, a little bit to see if there are any questions that are a little bit more general, not state specific um, that we could answer. Um, well, one person did ask if, if you haven't worked for about 10 years, are you still even eligible? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Does anybody else? Well, you're, you're always eligible for social security disability application, but that's a, that's a process. You know, you're, you are not eligible for private disability insurance unless you're paying into that or your company's paying into that and you're a current employee. Mm -hmm. So you can either have your own private disability insurance policy or many companies offer them mm -hmm. as part of your compensation your health insurance compensation package so mm -hmm. yeah and somebody asked about uh when if you're working when should you start with short-term disability and i think you uh, you addressed that early like right away right you is that is not what you said <coughs> that you think it's no big deal but um you never know what's going to happen aaron i think you said that I think short-term disability is different than what I was speaking to. I was speaking to estate planning and just making sure from a health insurance coverage perspective. So okay. I think short-term disability is if, uh, you know, I have it at my job. They're like, if you need some time off, just to refocus or you're having a rough time, you can apply for short-term disability. And then the longer you're on short-term disability, your income goes, gets reduced the longer you're on short-term. It was helpful Correct. for me through my employer to work with the caseworker too that managed mm -hmm. the short-term and long-term disability because at the, at the time I didn't even have a diagnosis. I just, uh, something was going on. I was trying to figure it out. And so she helped me navigate the workplace options for short-term short and then long-term. And then they connected me. Your employer has a vested interest that you get put on social security disability income because um, they don't have to pay you that long-term disability part if social security is paying it. Does that make sense? So um, uh, let's say I'm guaranteed $5,000 a month and social security is going to pay me 3000 of that a month. My employer only has to pick up the other 2000 um, if social security is picking it up. 
So, um, and everybody's employer is different, but I think the first thing you, you can do is, is connect with your employer. Kevin had a very good point and, and you two, Tom, connect with your employer, that honest talk. What are my options? You have probably a guide for your policy. Mm -hmm. Look through Perfect. that. What does it say? Be sure you keep a copy of that current one somewhere so that you, you have it to, to refer to. Who's your connection in your, in your job that's going to help you with that short-term disability? Then look at the next step. Do I want to stay on long-term disability? I also, too, wanted to say that that if you go on disability and you decide that you want to go back to work, that is an option. It, it, it's not a, it doesn't have to be a for everything, for everything. Is it complicated? Probably. <laughs> and I'm looking at, yeah, but, but there's return to work programs. So it's not, um, I, I think it's a decision that shouldn't be taken lightly and you should be fairly certain, but it, it's, it, um, nothing is has to be forever if if there's a decision that you decide that maybe there's a cure next month and we're all going back to work awesome. yeah that's that's true but although if you do leave your, your you go back to work and you lose your 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 uh, disability insurance you may not get that back okay I, that do I that. didn't yeah, yeah that part that I don't and it may also be the same with SSID, Social Security Disability Insurance. If you go back to work, you may not, you have to requalify again for that as yeah, well. So correct. As far as Social Security or uh, disability goes, there is two different types. There's short-term disability, which usually lasts a, a specific amount of time, like 90 days or something. And then long-term kicks in after that. It, it's sort of like this 90-day period to decide whether you really are disabled. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do that to take care of um, like a, major car accident injuries and things like that. That way the employer can kind of take you off the payroll, so to speak, and you're, you're paid through the, the short-term disability. But if it, in like with Parkinson's, that's a very long-term prognosis. So uh, and it gets worse. So it's, you, you almost immediately go from short-term to long-term and then you're, you're in the long-term game for however long well, yeah. until you, 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 you social media, Heather, I, I, I do see that one on the thread. Somebody's asking about cautions about social media. Yeah, I mean, this is huge. I've even had friends who know me really well confuse my social media for something very personal, which it is most certainly not. I also want to add as a j joke on the side, every time I see STD, I giggle a little bit. I'm like, what are we really talking about here, guys? Don't tell me about this. Yeah. You have to buy me a drink first. That's a that totally short term. Call. We did that one like a few weeks ago. Yeah, that's we missed that. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, you want to miss that call. <laughs> yeah, that's not I short term. Aaron, Aaron and then Kevin. Yeah, yeah, Mel, I just have something to say in closing. I know we're coming up to time, um, but I think one of the biggest things that I learned when I started my new job is not to be afraid to have conversations with your employer. And when I started my new job, I said, hey, as a person with a disability, what do you have available to me? Um, and I found out we have uh, an ADA attorney that I have access to that's free that I wouldn't have known if I didn't ask the question because it's not broadcasted in the package of what's available to you when you work there. Um, so I do think there's probably some different things that are available for people with disabilities that I think you have to ask the question to get the answer for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Amy, Amy, to help you with your defense of attorneys, yeah. you want a good attorney, yeah. you want a great accountant, and you want a fantastic financial planner. Yeah, that's great. Jessica asked, what type of professional can guide you through the decision about like when to retire versus going on disability? All of those three, I think, are part of that package um, that's really going to help you make the decision because you 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 can't just have the information on one. You you really need um, somebody to look at your financial situation right now, what it could be in the future, um, and then your, obviously, your disability and, and social security. Um, Kevin, did you have something else that you wanted to share? No, I don't want to be distracting. I think this has been a fabulous <laughs> conversation. I, I'm learning so much from all of you through this, and I just thank you and the foundation for holding this. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Uh, Heather, did you something? Your hand? I, really just, I really just wanted to say thank you so much, too, because this is all news to me. I'm learning from the questions people are asking. So thank you to everyone. I'll continue researching and post some things on the kiddo site as well. Yeah, and finally, I think once again, it is state dependent. So I mean, or dependent on where you are. So 
consult or, or if you if you're at a loss to get started call your ambassador that that's in your state your finney ambassador we can at least help you find the find the trail absolutely uh, thank you all again. Everybody said yes, we could use another session on this. I think you're right. Oh, yeah. uh, but, uh, but definitely, you know, send in your questions and, um, you know, we'll do what we can to help you out. And if you find out something great from your state or something that you, you know, are learning through your process, definitely feel free to share those with us. Thank you, everybody. Next time, we will be talking about something I completely forgot about. Does anybody remember what our next session is? Uh, it's October, it's November, November. mental health. Mental health. That's chocolate chip cookies. About. Yes, that's and great. Another okay, we're talking about that um, in November, and then we're talking about medication management in December. Um, actually, we had a great medication management webinar um, this week that was fabulous. If you haven't seen that, definitely you want to check out our website and sign up for that so you can get the recording. It was one of the best that I've I've ever done. It was just so, so well done. Dr. Aaron Howell was amazing. Um, any questions, send them to me at blog at dpf.org. And in the meantime, live well. We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.